and welcome to Are You Karate Kidding Me? Your resource for recaps, reviews of Cobra Kai, Karate Kid, and items of interest from all around the Miyagi-verse. I'm your host, Colin Canada. I am your host, Jenny Carlson, and indeed, we are travelers in the Miyagi-verse. The Miyagi-verse, the, the line of continuity that follows Pat Morita all the way from Karate Kid 1 through the next Karate Kid and through Cobra Kai, but not the Jackie Chan reboot. Yes, yes. And today we are here with a Cobra Kai review. That's right. Season 2, Episode 7, Lull. Lull. However, before we get started, there are a couple of items of news. What's going on on Karate Kid Twitter, Colin? Well, Karate Kid Twitter is a buzz about a couple of things. What's surprising is what news we don't have, and that is a Season 3 trailer. Ah, yes. I think the fans are running hot, speculation is running wild, and if we're not careful, it may run all out of control. I cannot remember when the season two trailer dropped. Me neither, but I think the general consensus among most people is the trailer should have dropped by now. I mean, it should definitely... Well, I mean, the whole episode, the entire show should have dropped by now so that we can live in it forever. That's true. And generally, what time of year did the seasons generally drop? It's usually around April-ish? Yes. Late April, early May? Yes. So now would be the window for a trailer drop if we're going to get one. I I mean, mean, I'm just checking my door for that drop. Well, I mean, the nice thing is we are in a space where we can freely speculate about what this trailer is and what this season is. And we still have time to see if we're right. That's true. I mean, by the time our episode drops, although hopefully we'll have a fast turnaround, the trailer could be out. Mm. And then people can check and see if we were right or wrong. That would be very fun. Do you want to do like a a quick round robin predictions? Sure. Excellent. My prediction, and this may not be a very popular prediction, but I feel like season three may be the final season. Do you think they'd tell us that in the trailer? I think it's the kind of thing you'd want to hype. For sure. Yeah. Whether it actually is the final season or not, that can go either way. I think it'll definitely be the final season on YouTube. Yeah. I think if the show decides to go more seasons, they're going to have to find another home for it. This is the last season that YouTube may be willing to pay for. I think if they... Even if it's the best dramedy on television right now? It's not on television. It's on YouTube. I think (laughs) if Cobra Kai wants to live beyond YouTube, they'll have to jump to a regular television network or to a regular network's streaming service that's fair okay but that's more of a speculation about the future of cobra kai and in terms of what will be in the trailer right okay so i think that we're gonna see a little teaser of okinawa Mm -hmm. um i'm not sure what is standing in for okinawa here maybe somewhere in california i don't think they're gonna shoot outside of california for this but there are some georgia but yeah they'll find some places in georgia that look mountainous enough to be an island somewhere i think i have not been following set reports y'all so if you're listening and going come on we know that i've been following and sitting outside i know i'm sorry i just i didn't want to get too spoiled this year Mm -hmm. because i have a feeling that like once this is over i'm gonna miss the days when i didn't know what was coming well as far as plot stuff is concerned i think we'll definitely get to see daniel down on his luck for the first time in a while yeah i think we may see some surprises from where Johnny has landed after all this, like maybe he's moved away, maybe he's maybe he's the one in Okinawa. Well, I mean, I'm, they said the show is going to Okinawa. They did not say which specific character. I think Johnny and Daniel are going to Okinawa together. That would be wild. I don't know why, but I just have a feeling that would be the most rewarding for me personally to watch, so I'm going to hope for it. I think the big question that I have is of the two things that we saw hinted at at the end of the season. Well, one is just Miguel. We know that um, that Jolo comes back. So is he going to be seen uh, in the trailer? Are they already going to give us that? And also, are we going to see a reminder of Allie having called Johnny? Like, will we flash on Elizabeth Shue's face? If we're going back to Okinawa, obviously there are plenty of people that they can let us know about and feature in the next season. But I don't know how much they'll show us because of where they want to build suspense. That is a great question. Who will get shown in the trailer and why and in what? Will we see Tamil and Tamita? Give me Tamil and Tamita. While we await that trailer, we have other news from the Miyagi-verse. And it's a reminder that the Miyagi-verse is not only the Marita-verse, but anyone who incorporates or who incarnates Mr. Miyagi as Marita originated him. Because this week also the news dropped that there is a Karate Kid musical in development for Broadway 
um, with Robert Mark Kamen back, the original screenwriter of The Karate Kid, the originator of the story, um, back to write the words. Uh, Drew Gasparini is going to do the score, and it's going to be directed by Aman Miyamoto, who was the first Asian director to direct on Broadway in 2004. He directed Pacific Overtures. He's also d- directed in the West End of London with the Fantastics and the Magic Flute in Austria. So he's really cool, um, has a really eminent record, and that's going to be neat. They don't have an opening night or an opening date yet, but that news is really exciting. And I think depending on the, the timetable, we may have to go to New York to see this. Oh, that's true. If they put if they put Karate Kid up on Broadway and it goes through and it makes it, then that means you and I have to review it, which means you and I will have to go to New York. Oh, how how what a terrible fate for us. Twist my arm. So, yeah, um but I will also say if if Mr. Miyamoto is listening and surely he is, if he's doing exhaustive research for this, that the person he should cast for either an alley style character or for the Karate Kid themselves, is Julia Macchio, because she is a badass musical theater talent. Hmm. Yes. That is, I love everything about this. Yes. I think that would be pretty rad. And if you don't follow her on Instagram or Twitter, she is a delight to follow. Also, she's Ralph Macchio's uh, doppelganger. Like, that's obviously Parthenogenesis that produced Julia Macchio. Cast her, please. And with that, I think we're ready to get into the episode. Are you ready to get into this episode? I'm ready to dive deep. Get stuck in? All right, excellent. Wait, no, I don't want to get... This is actually kind of a hard episode. Like, I don't know if I want to get stuck there. Fair. But I need to work my way through it. That's true. We both need to work through this lull. It's season two, episode seven. Lull. Lull. Am I the only one who keeps thinking of the Star Trek character Lol, Data's daughter, every time we say Lol? That's just because we've been knee-deep in Picard for the last couple of weeks. Commander, what are your intentions toward my daughter? Your daughter? That's um. true. <laughs> so we open at the LaRusso manse. It is dawn, and Amanda is waking up, rolling over, and saying good morning to Daniel, but he is not there. He has already headed out. So Amanda calls Daniel on the old telephone and finds that he's at the dojo. He says he wanted to get started on today's lesson plan. Why isn't Daniel wearing his Bluetooth in this one? Does he? Ha- he does have a Bluetooth he's, headset, doesn't he? He's doing the well. He's doing the cool grown-up thing of the pack-in Apple earphones with one earphone in and one earphone out. I thought that was just an "I'm running somewhere and don't have time" thing. And that's the point of all cool looks, right? Is the is is the I don't have time for this look. Daniel's going into the dojo, and Amanda's like, "What about lunch with Anoush? He's not happy." And Daniel's like, I'll worry about that. And Daniel hears something as he's getting off the phone. So he goes outside and instead of finding Robbie there, he finds Crease. Crease is bringing the snark early this morning. He says, it's a cute little place you got here. You teach karate or gardening. Daniel doesn't say this, but it's actually a little bit of both. Yeah, knowing what good friends these guys are in real life, it's kind of funny to see them squaring off in the in the yard like this, but they completely sell it. Chris is telling Daniel, I'm just here to say thank you. Thank me for what? Taking our weakest soldiers from our ranks. When Daniel finds Chris in the backyard, he's already punching on the punching bag, which seems to be a popular thing for bad guys to come by Miyagi-Do to do. This is also similar to something that happened in Karate Kid 3. When Terry it was- Silver. I know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> a little subtle callback there. Kreese is telling Daniel that he should thank him for toughening up his students because... Kreese thanks Daniel for taking the weakest soldier from Cobra Kai's ranks. Yeah, the weakest uh, soldiers because this is a war and everyone needs to be ready, basically. He says... You may think you got the best of Johnny Lawrence, but I promise you, this time I won't let him lose. Lose what? This isn't war. You know, Daniel and Kreese kind of have a disagreement here over whether they are actually are at war or not. But newsflash, Daniel, if you have to ask the question, guess what? You're at war. You're at war. Exactly. Sure it is. War never ends. Peace is just the love between battles. And also then Kreese says insultingly, Regards to Mr. Miyagi. And throws the butt of his cigar into a potted plant. Yeah, he chucks it right into one of the bonsai trees. Real classy guy. Bonsai tree. Real tough guy. Fast forward back to the LaRusso manse where Sam has Moon over and they're drinking a smoothie thing. Point of order, is this 
This is Moon's house, not LaRusso Mance. And this is the Moon Base Alpha. Destination Moon Base Alpha. An epic adventure across the universe. Yes, Moon... Not Moon Unit Zappa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my Moon Base. No, not Moon Unit Zappa. <laughs> this is the first time we've seen Moon in a, in a minute. In and her natural habitat. Certainly the first time we've seen her in her natural habitat. They're taking the opportunity to get caught up and... Uh, talk about well boys really so as they talk they are looking at what sam has to work out in which supports my theory that this might actually be sam's bedroom but we may disagree anyway moon immediately figures out that sam's worrying about what she should wear because she has a crush on robbie and moon's like what about miguel good question great question moon's like does miguel know why should we care if miguel knows and of course moon says my mom's therapist says you can't hide from your heart which makes me think that moon's mom is the is the most interesting off-screen person that's true hopefully we'll get moon's mom in season three (laughs) given what we know about from season one and now season two hopefully moon and her mom will get a whole arc in season three. moon and mrs moon yes indeed madam moon madam Wow. Okay. Fortune telling Madam Moon. Not to be confused with Madam Mim. I'm the magnificent, marvelous Mad Madam Mim. Cut to Cobra Kai, where Miguel is hanging out with the guys. They're all warming up, and Johnny comes in. And Miguel comes right over to Johnny, offers him condolences for his loss, asks how the funeral was. And so we can tell from this that Johnny's been gone for a few days. Johnny wants to know how things are going, for sure. Uh, Miguel just answers that... I mean, Sensei Kreese is tough, but uh, he knows what it takes to win. ruh So and Johnny goes into the office. Yeah, Johnny goes into the office and finds that... What the hell happened here? Kreese has been doing a little KonMari. Well, I spent some time organizing the place. And the thing that brings him the most joy was his Vietnam self-portrait. Yes, clearly his old special ops photo sparks joy, and he says, Buddy of mine took that photo. And I think that we know, we know who that buddy was. It had to have been. (laughs) Kreese also notes that he cleaned things up, he paid some bills, or bills were overdue, so... That's right, he's clearly also set up a QuickBooks for Cobra Kai. QuickBooks helps me get paid manage cash flow, and run payroll. And now I'm back on top. I don't know who has the password to that QuickBooks. You're making yourself right at home, huh? They come back out of the office and are talking to the kids, and apparently it's the day that they are going out into the woods for some outdoor training exercises at Coyote Creek. And what's there at Coyote Creek? <laughs> Karate coyotes. Chris says it's time to separate the men from the boys. Johnny knows what's going to happen, and he says he's not sure they're ready for this, but the kids are eager to go. And so then Chris does a real power move by acting like it's Johnny's choice. It's up to Sensei Lawrence. If he says it's okay, then and only then is it okay. Johnny is like, he knows that he has no way to win here, because if he says they can't go, then he'll look like he's denying them something they want, and he'll be the, the party pooper, as it were. That's yeah. right. It's a real main teacher has become the substitute teacher situation. Indeed. So Johnny assents to it, and they are going. All right. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Back at Miyagi Do, it's super hot. Everyone's drinking water. Everyone's sweating because global warming is real. Yeah, global warming has definitely arrived at Miyagi Do. Daniel is fretting about what he's gotten the kids into in light of this surprise visit from Kreese. Yet, he's still being Mr. Miyagi. He's going to work with the affordances of the natural environment. He says he considers this heat to be a gift. Once again, never one to meet a teaching opportunity he didn't like. He decides to engage the kids in some shoju geiko. Uh, shoju geiko? Shoju geiko. Shoju geiko. Shoju geiko. Shoju geiko. Bonsai tree. Which is extreme heat training. Exactly, because someday the fight may come to you, so you have to push yourself to your limit. The fight will not come when it's 75 degrees and breezy. Yeah, extreme heat training, or as it's known in Austin in August... Thursday. Thursday, indeed. (laughs) Or, apparently right now, Chicago, where people are in shirt sleeves in winter. Cut to Coyote Creek. Coyote Creek, where the Cobra Kai's have been split into red and black teams. The goal is to capture as many headbands as you can from the other side. It's a standard war game, but instead of paintball guns, like in that episode of Spaced... Yes! Oh my! (sighs) I'm just going to be the hero after all. 
fact, we've got fists and kicks. Yeah, and Kreese is the one narrating, explaining the rules while Johnny stands by and looks on with some concern. Kreese explains that the people across from you are not your friends, they are the enemy. And last team standing wins. And we see Hawk and Miguel nodding at each other, knowingly, kind of like, this will be fun, or this is the deal. Johnny's got his arms folded the whole time, just watching the whole thing unfold. Last team standing wins. How do we get the headbands? By any means possible. No. Chris says. Johnny does underscore this is just an exercise, so they should use their judgment. While the kids nod at each other like... It should be fun. It's life and death, according to Crease. Yeah, exactly. Just then, Raymond rolls up, or Ray, freshly rebranded as Sting Ray. Raymond has arrived in kind of a... Braided beard. Braided beard and all, in kind of a weird callback to Hawk's rebranding in season one, except... Yeah, you know what? I just decided to flip the script. This time, we're kind of lampshading it a little bit. He says he's flipping the script. You can refer to me... As Stingray. And we also hear kind of a, a parody of the Hawk theme happening. Meanwhile, back at Miyagi Do, everyone's standing in a circle with people fighting in the middle, starting with Robbie. Two. And they're calling numbers to get people to run in when their number's called. Sam gets called, and she and Robbie are sparring. And it is hot. No, no, Five. like literally. Oh, yeah, it's literally hot. I mean, yeah, exactly. They are definitely feeling the heat. Yes. Yes, indeed. But it's Dimitri's turn, everyone. Dimitri, get in there. So Dimitri comes in and... Well, he performs as expected. He does. Three. <sighs> Chris almost drops him. Chris is uh, the guy from Cobra Kai. Yeah, one of our Cobra Kai expatriates. And the next person who comes in, I can't see who that is, but he does drop him. And so Dimitri is, of course, mad. His, his worst suspicions about his own failures have been uh, proven true, and everyone is asking for a break. Yeah, Sam wants to take a break, uh, saying that the heat is brutal, which is true. Daniel decides to take her feedback, and hot on the heels of this hot suggestion, Daniel has a cool idea. Indeed. We'll see no. what that is in a moment. But meanwhile, back at Coyote Creek, we see Miguel and Tori are flirting with each other about their headbands. Luckily, they're on the same team. And then they hear a rustling in the background where one of the red team members rolls up and is preparing to fight. But Miguel's like, no, no, not me. You take Tori first. And so Tori, of course, easily kicks the crap out of this guy. And then Miguel takes over. Yeah, Together, they kind of tag team him. it. Exactly. Tori snatches the headband. And as they walk off saying, no mercy, Johnny looks on a little freaked out. Exactly. Well, as well he should. Meanwhile, we are now with the Miyagi-Do kids in a giant meat locker. After finding that the, the shoju geiko is no good, they are going to try some kan geiko. Yeah, it's time for kan geiko, which is apparently training in the cold. Shoju geiko and kan geiko are real things, obviously. Um, they don't just mean training while hot or cold. Shoju geiko was invented in the judo community in the late 19th century, um, and it's, I think, traditionally like a 30-day training season where you train in the hottest season to build your strength and become more resilient. I think they've shortened it since to like two weeks or 10 days. Um, and Kan is the, the is the cold weather counterpart for that. So these are real things that aren't just in the karate community, but in Japanese martial arts more broadly. They probably have historical origins beyond that, but I don't know what they are. Daniel, having taken them through the broiler this morning, he's going to switch it up and alternate heat and cold. With like a big-ass fridge. You get a hot side hot. You get a cool side cool. New big D L T. And he says that this is going to work for them because... In the meat locker, you can see the exhalation of breath, the twitch of a muscle, the shift of a stance. Indeed, you're going to learn to anticipate. But what Daniel does not anticipate is that Amanda is calling him right now. His phone is ringing, and he sends it to voicemail. Ooh, not cool, cut, Daniel. Cut to LaRusso Auto, where Amanda is sitting with Anoush with a pile of food, and then Anoush's phone goes off, and Anoush looks down and says he's not coming, and gets up and leaves the desk. Anoush has had it, uh, and rightly so. Yeah, I don't blame him. And Amanda tries to call Daniel back to let him know this is happening, but again, it goes straight to voicemail. Daniel, what are you doing? You don't set your phone to do not disturb in this kind of a situation. I mean, a likely story. Leave a message and he probably won't call you back. Phone, 
So back at Coyote Creek, we see Hawk squaring off against Mitch. Mitch is usually Hawk's second in command, his pilot fish. But right now, Hawk is about to drop Mitch because they're on different teams. And Hawk defeats him, takes his headband, and then sneers, I guess I earned my Medal of Honor, while flashing it. Oh, that's right. Hawk flashes his stolen valor here. But Miguel oversees it and realizes that Hawk is the one who trashed the Miyagi Dojo. So, back at the big-ass fridge, Sam and Robbie are doing some hot slow-mo sparring in the cold, cold fridge. And it looks like this new technique of Daniels is actually working. They circle each other, and we've gone into slow motion, so you know it's serious. Absolutely. And then we hear these Zemphir-sounding pipes, and Robbie advances on Sam, and she blocks, kicks him out, and they had a stalemate with serious eye contact and breath clouds. And then it's Dimitri's turn to give it a shot. Poor Dimitri. He's already denigrating himself, and then he gets the shit kicked out of him. And Daniel's like, come on, Dimitri. Anticipate. You could do this. But while he's explaining to Dimitri yet again, his phone goes off. He ignores it again. Daniel's really coaching the hell out of Dimitri uh, while Amanda is still getting sent to Do Not Disturb. As Daniel begins coaching Dimitri and the camera cuts away, we see Daniel's phone laying in the big-ass fridge with all these missed calls. Cut back to Coyote Creek where Aisha has just lost her headband and Johnny says, gamely, you'll get him next time. And, And Aisha seems pretty cool with it, even though she has had issues with losing in the past. So that makes Tori and Aisha are out of the competition now. And it's just Hawk and Miguel left, as far as we know, yeah. right? So then we already cut back to the meat locker, where Dimitri is going on about all the ways in which this sucks, and he can't do it because he's got a hole in his sock and all these other things. And Daniel says to him, Dimitri, you are the most neurotic person that I know, but you could use that to your advantage. Because you anticipate. That's an interesting way of looking at it. This is really sweet and endearing and also, like, savvy of Daniel. It shows that he learned from Mr. Miyagi how to use what's available as a lesson. I've been talking about Dimitri's paranoia as a superpower is not misplaced, but it's sort of like if Obi-Wan Kenobi told C-3PO that the Force was strong with him and he was going to train him in the ways of the Jedi. This is three times heroics! Uh, Daniel also explains to Dimitri that he basically has a spidey sense. Except it's a spider sense. Actually, in the comics, they call it spider sense. Dimitri wants us to know. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Daniel wants Dimitri to use this spider sense to anticipate the attack, any attack. You think he could do that? And it works. It does work. As Dimitri begins to use his arachnid anticipatory skill, he looks around waiting to see who's going to move first. And then he's prepared when Chris runs out and makes a move on him. Dimitri blocks both punches and then gets him with a very good punch to the solar plexus. And he gets a gut punch in return for his trouble. Yeah, the next guy comes out and kicks him because he's so busy celebrating that he does not anticipate. But then Daniel is looking at his phone because he sees that he's in big trouble, which, of course, Sam immediately notices. But Daniel's like, we're done. Bye. (laughs) Running off as if it's all fine. Yeah, it's big trouble in this little Chinese restaurant or wherever we are. And then it's time to cut back to Coyote Creek. Meanwhile, back at Coyote Creek, we see Miguel up against a tree waiting for Hawk, who's stalking around looking for Miguel, and Hawk says, finally a worthy opponent. We finally get our Hawk versus Miguel 1v1. And Miguel says, so you're the one who trashed Miyagi-Do. And took that Medal of Honor. But Hawk says, they're the enemy, I had to put them in their place. Uh, But Miguel's not happy with this stolen valor situation, so this final duel has just become personal. Yeah, Hawk basically tells Miguel to come and take it, and so they they square off. And of course we know that Miguel's going to kick Hawk's ass, right? But we got to get a show. Here it comes. Hawk comes in with some big fly kicks and things like that. He's going for Miguel. He's launching himself off the trees. Miguel is just basically staying low to the ground and kicking like there's no tomorrow and then punching. And then just whereas Hawk's more of a like a pretty showman, Miguel just has the sheer brute force to take Hawk down. And he does. Gets him in the chest. Even though Hawk flips him over, Miguel's ready, fakes him out so that Hawk climbs the tree. And then he's punching and hitting until he finally drops Hawk. They're basically flipping over each other at this point. Miguel had Hawk on the ground briefly. Hawk managed to recover, but then Miguel finally manages to snatch both the red headband and the stolen Medal of Honor. But the ruckus draws everyone over. Yeah. Not in time to see the Medal of Honor, but in time to see Miguel triumphantly raise the red bandana to the sky. And Kreese tells Miguel to... 
While Johnny looks on, really concerned at this point, Miguel kicks Hawk in the face. It's a knockout kick, as it were, and everyone celebrates Miguel. And Kreese says to Johnny, he's really developing a killer instinct, but not entirely so, because then, boom, who pops out of a pile of leaves? But Stingray? <laughs> Stingray appears from the pile of leaves. In a uh, bunch of face paint. In, in a bunch of face paint. The red team just won! Claiming victory for the red team after all. But it's more of a Pyrrhic victory as Stingray had to leap from behind while Miguel was distracted. Yes. But he technically did win the exercise. So yes. the red team is rejoicing. Johnny comes over and says to Miguel, It's not I taught you to fight. And Miguel's like, well, Sensei Kreese taught us. This isn't a tournament. This is real life. And, and Johnny's like, is that how you want to live your life? So Johnny has clearly learned the lessons that the elder Cobras brought to him, especially Tommy in the previous episode. That is a very good point. But enough of that. It's back to the Miyagi-Do apartment. A.K.A. Daniel's dojo turned pool house turned guest room at the LaRusso Mance. That's right. Robbie is folding up some clothes, it looks like, and Sam comes in to visit him without knocking. And Robbie looks almost annoyingly happy to see her, so they are going to take a moment to flirt, I think. And that's right. Sam's all like, I like what you've done with the place. Robbie returns with, What do you like better today, the heat or the cold? Sam's like, You know, they both have their pluses and minuses, but... You know, Sam says, What about you? And this is where Robbie kind of moves in and goes, I like the heat. Evidently. Oh, teenagers, man. Teenagers. Yeah. I mean, they are super into each other. They are very, very into each other. Very serious about it, especially Robbie. Like, they weren't going to do it, they say, but then they both lean in for a kiss. So, uh-oh. Back at LaRusso Auto, Daniel is walking up to Anusha's office, which is, of course, dark and locked. And Amanda is waiting for him to tell him that Anusha's has left. Daniel thinks that he can get him back from Tom Cole and tries to salvage the situation as daniel always tries to do daniel wants to lure him back with surf and turf amanda's like nothing doing Daniel. yeah this is this is not gonna work and amanda's like this isn't even about a noosh this is about you not being able to keep your promises you said you would be able to balance everything and now look where we are that's right amanda uses her superpower which is pinning daniel under the cold logic of reality indeed so, you know, she says that I've been running this business all by myself. I have spent the entire summer feeling alone while you're off at karate camp. And Anoush is the last straw. And she says, well, sometimes when you focus on one thing, you lose focus of everything else that matters. Daniel loads up so many explanations and promises, but Amanda's not having it. She's like, I'm not talking about the dealership. I'm talking about us. I mean, she spent the whole summer alone. What can you do? This makes and, Daniel very sad. Yeah, Daniel just looks on and sad Ralph Macchio is truly one of the saddest things in street media off she walks and daniel is left standing alone in the dealership all the bonsai trees in the world won't cure that no indeed bonsai tree meanwhile we cut back to the larusso manse where robbie is standing in the living room chuckling fondly while looking at a younger picture of sam and here's someone at the door he opens the door and to his surprise it's miguel and of course robbie is immediately unfriendly to him but miguel's like i just came to give something back and holds up the medal, and Robbie's like, I knew you took it. And Miguel's like, I had nothing to do with that or what happened to your dojo. Yeah, he's like, we're not all assholes. Which really should be stenciled up on the wall at Cobra Kai (laughs) next to Strike Hard, Strike Fast, No Mercy. Next to Strike First, Strike Hard, No Mercy. So Robbie is dusted off his old glower and is giving that to Miguel. Miguel asks him to tell Sam that he's sorry. Robbie immediately pretends that he didn't know who it was. It was someone who had the wrong house. He lies to Sam, which, of course, he will pay for later because this is Cobra Kai where karma exists. Miguel was trying to play a karmic door dash, if you will. Robbie is looking on fondly as Sam goes upstairs. I think Robbie might suspect that was a bad idea. Cut to the office at Cobra Kai where Crease is priming and lighting up a cigar sitting at the desk, and Johnny comes in to confront him. Chris has really dug in after taking this assistant teaching position, and he is really entirely too at home in Johnny's office. And Johnny's like, We need to talk about what you've been putting in my kid's head since I've been gone. And Chris is just like, Just been teaching him the way of the fist. Same lessons I taught you. Strike first, strike hard. No mercy. And Johnny's like, Cobra Kai needs to change. It's a pretty classic change versus stagnation scenario. Johnny says, What you taught didn't work back then and it doesn't work now. Chris tries to cast aspersions on Johnny's strength and also by extension his masculinity. And Johnny's like, But there's a difference between no mercy and no honor. This is what Johnny learned in his first year of teaching at Cobra Kai. Yeah, and Kreese's position is This that is war. This is war, and we will always be at war. And when you're at war, the other side never fights with any honor. And Kreese is like, take it from me, I know. And Johnny's just like, yeah, I don't know what shit you went through back then. 
that these are good kids and they don't need to relive our mistakes. So Johnny is truly the only adult in the room here. Although Chris says, The only mistake is teaching them weakness. And calls Johnny out for not fighting Daniel about the Medal of Honor. Essentially so, backing down from Daniel's perceived challenge. Yeah. Then Chris tells Johnny that he, I am responsible for you. You are still my student. He's worried about him because he's going to let his guard down and be vulnerable, which is, of course, to a man like Kreese, the worst thing any other man could possibly do. But Johnny, man, he's learned so much. Like, this is my dojo. I make the rules. And then Kreese is like, You forget who started Cobra Kai. I haven't forgotten anything. So at this moment, as Kreese is just not having it, Johnny's like, You know what? I'm sorry. I thought this could work, but I was wrong. I don't ever want to see you in this dojo. Again. When Johnny tells Chris to go, it sort of feels like in uh, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, when Peter Jackson cuts and shows a golem from two sides. So it's like his golem personality is fighting with his Smeagol personality. You now and never come back. That's very much how this scene feels, except we know what happens that even though Gollum leaves for a while, he's always going to come back. So Chris just stands there looking at Johnny, doesn't say anything, and then looks down and goes. I mean, Billy Zobka's killing it in this scene. And They're both killing it in this scene. Really, there's nothing Kreese can say. All he can do is walk out the door. You know, for Johnny, this is the biggest confrontation of his life, pretty much, aside from telling Robbie that he's sorry at the end of season one. This is a huge moment for him because he's realized that boundaries are more important than some idea of redemption. And now we have the end snake. That was Cobra Kai, season two, episode seven, Lull. Lull. We have three episodes, or two, I guess, till the finale begins. With that in mind... Indeed. What did we think about today's episode? Man, this ep- Man, Cobra Kai is so mu- There's so much going on, right? And, like, mm-hmm. ev- the writers, every scene, every line, does, like, three different things, mm-hmm. you know, different kinds of work. Every episode is, is freighted with, like, heavy emotions and also levities. I never really feel too comfortable when I watch Cobra Kai, especially season two, because with Crease around, I'm just constantly on my guard as creeps would want me to be i mean the thing that strikes me about this episode is how on paper it doesn't really look like that much there's no big guest stars like there were last week you know there's no big set pieces except maybe some of the coyote creek stuff but that's really just outdoor training that we've seen in other episodes they even kind of play their hand a little bit by naming this episode Lull. Like, yeah. this is the calm before the storm, really. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't feel like they had any ambitions beyond that. I mean, not to say that nothing happens in this episode. No, a lot of things happen uh, A lot in this of things episode. happen, but it, it feels like there's definitely a lot of tension in the air. We're definitely setting a lot of things up that we're going to start paying off in these last few episodes leading up to the finale. The calm before the storm, but everything is is moving around to precipitate the storm. Johnny standing up to Kreese, like I just said, is like one of the most significant confrontations of his life mm-hmm. at this point. And it's much more meaningful than the first time he stood up to Kreese, which was after he lost the All Valley to Daniel in 1984, right? Because he's like saying... You know, it's not just that you're being a jerk, it's that your philosophy is deeply wrong and I won't let you do this and I'm not going to give you the forgiveness that I hope to give you. If Johnny hadn't done that, this could have all gone very differently. Right. Right? I mean, like, we've got two big confrontations that end this episode. One is Daniel seeing that his fixation on training the students out of fear is costing him his family. And Johnny seeing that his desire to be magnanimous and loving, perhaps so that Robbie will also love him, so that others will show him love, can't outweigh his ability to stop harm that's going on in front of his face. Mm -hmm. Those two confrontations will shape how those men deal with the, the conflict to come. I think that in terms of character moments in this episode, amongst the young folks, it's hard because... It feels very plot heavy, not not because of what is written here, but just what the story is doing. Like, of course, Robbie and Sam are into each other. Of course, it would get intense when they fight. Like, we're seeing something fulfilled that we've sort of anticipated since the early moments of this season and, and even last season. And with Miguel and Hawk, that's hard to watch because, you know, we know that Hawk is going the way of darkness and that Miguel is less so. But to see that... Miguel 
and Hawk are like coming to blows, even as they both are doing what Kreese tells them to do, like that's that's hard, and that's gonna that's gonna affect them in the future episodes as well. The other thing that kind of strikes me about this episode is Daniel's arc and the things that are going on in Miyagi Do. I think the Kun Geiko and Shoju Geiko parallels fire and ice Mm -hmm. yeah from a few episodes back yeah i thought that yeah episode three it kind of made me think about that this stuff with amanda is kind of the opposite of what johnny is going through with crease to whereas like this karate school thing is driving a wedge in their relationship in a way that daniel didn't anticipate and 